to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. After Jesus had calmed the tumultuous seas, the disciples responded by saying, and they feared exceedingly and asked among themselves, who can this be that even the wind and the seas obey him? Mark chapter 4, verse number 41. Today, in our series of lessons, More About Jesus, we want to ask and let the Scripture answer that very question. Who is Jesus Christ? What was He really like? What's His nature? And are the images and ideas that people often have about Jesus in accord with His life in Scripture? As we think about the life of Jesus Christ, we especially want to ask and emphasize the nature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What was Jesus really like? And what is His nature that we read in Scripture? And does that fit with the way society often thinks or portrays the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, there are basically four views that people will hold about Christ. There are some who would say that Jesus was a liar that His miracles were false and fake, that He was not God, that He did not live a perfect life, and that everything He said was not true. Whether that person is an atheist or agnostic or believes in some other religious background, they might hold the view that Jesus was a liar. A second view that some might hold is that Jesus was a great leader. Uh, like Moses in the Old Testament or like Joshua who led God's people into the Promised Land, Jesus was a good, physical, earthly leader. The Beatitudes, one of the greatest speeches ever given. The Sermon on the Mount, probably one of the greatest sermons ever. Uh, John 6 verse 15, they want to take Jesus and make Him a king, a leader. But it kind of ends there. Just a leader. Just a physical leader. Just like other leaders in the world today maybe. A third aspect or third mindset that some people have about Jesus and that is that Jesus was a lunatic. That is, in John chapter 6, when Jesus said things like, eat my flesh and drink my blood, He was crazy. In John 3, when Jesus said, you've got to be born again, how can a man be born again? In Mark 3, when Jesus said, whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sisters, He was just kind of crazy. That the things He said were not true, that He was even a madman, some would say. And then there's a fourth view. The view that Jesus and the Scripture wants us to hold. And that is that Jesus is Lord. This is the view that most, if not all who believe in the Bible and Christianity, would ascribe to. Acts 2 verse 36, probably one of the key verses in all of Scripture proclaims, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. Or in the words of Paul, Acts 9 verse 6, Lord, what would you have me to do. And so let's take some time today and let's think about the character and nature of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Scripture with a twofold purpose in mind. Number one, as we think about these principles, I want to learn more about the true nature of Jesus so that I can gain that knowledge, understand who He is better, have a better appreciation for Him but with a second fold purpose in mind, and that is, I want to shape my life into the life of Christ. I want to let Jesus truly be seen in me, Acts 4 verse 13. I want to let the light of Christ shine by following His teaching, Matthew 5 verse number 16. And so, who was Jesus on a personal level? Jesus was a man who believed in prayer. Notice the words of Mark chapter 1 verse number 35. The Scripture records, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus went out, departed to a solitary place, and there prayed. Notice the details of this. In the morning, 
He got up a great while before daylight. In essence, he set his clock and got up early. He went out to a solitary place. He escaped all the hustle and bustle of life. What for? Why did he get up early? Why did he set his alarm clock in essence? Why did he get away from everything? And prayed. Jesus was a man of prayer. When you think about Christ and the prayers that He gave throughout the Bible, whether it be John 17 and the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 and you've got the disciples' prayer, His prayer to the Father in Luke 22 verse 44, all these show that in times of difficulty, in times where he, Jesus even spent one, all night in prayer one night in Mark chapter 6, He was indeed a man who believed in the power of prayer. You know, when you look throughout the Bible, at people who were great men and women of God. They were people who realized the importance of prayer. I'll give you a couple examples. I want you to take your mind back to the time of great persecution, a time when God's people are in captivity. And there is a prophet and his three friends by the name of Daniel. And they are taken from their home and placed in the area of Babylon and by the river Chebar, the Bible will tell us. And they're taken into a essence, uh, into the castle, we might say. And there, Daniel and his friends are told, don't pray to any other gods. When you hear this sound of the gong, in essence, when you hear this sound, everybody is to pray to this image that's been made of the king. What did Daniel do? When Daniel heard that sound, as was his custom from early days, with his window open toward Jerusalem, he prayed and fasted three times that day. Did it cost Daniel anything? You bet it did. When people found out Daniel disobeyed the king to obey God, and when they realized prayer to his God was that important, Daniel ended up in the lion's den. You remember how that story went. There wasn't a lion in that den that could hurt Daniel, for God took care of him. Daniel from his early days. Somebody taught Daniel from a child to pray, uh, from childhood to pray. Daniel thought it was so important that he would rather be thrown in with a, a den of ravenous lions than not pray to God. Another example. Paul and Silas are examples of prayer in the New Testament. Uh, the place is Philippi. They have been put in a dark, deep dungeon. In that dungeon, they are there for preaching and teaching about Christ and in essence hurting people's money because they cast out an evil spirit out of a woman who was demon possessed. But when they're in prison, the Bible says in Acts 16 verse 25 that they were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. What a powerful impact that had. Even so much so that God shakes the doors of the prison. They're eventually released. The jailer obeys the gospel. He becomes a Christian. But you think of men like Ezra, Nehemiah. You think of people like Daniel. You think of great men and women in the Old and New Testament. These are people of prayer. Friend, if I'm going to learn from the life of Jesus, how I desperately need to be a person of prayer. Do you remember the words of Luke 18, 1? Jesus taught us a powerful lesson. Very simply this. Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. What does it mean to lose heart? To get discouraged? To get down? To almost feel like giving up? Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever get discouraged? Does life ever get you down? Does sin ever tempt you to the point that you think, man, I almost want to give up? What do you do in situations like that? Men ought always to pray. James 5 verse 16 tells us why. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. That's why Christians ought to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Uh, this is why we ought to strive in every way to humbly approach the throne of God. Hebrews 4 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Friend, there is help to be had at the throne of God. It offers encouragement. I can ask God for help. I can, 1 Peter 5 verse 7, I can cast all my cares upon Him. He cares for me. And so when we think about Christ and His life, what a man of prayer He was, and how we need to utilize the strength and the tools that God gives us in accessing the throne of God in prayer. Secondly, when we think about Jesus and His nature and His person, let's realize as well that Jesus was indeed a logical individual. Jesus was a man of logic. What do we mean by logic? We mean sound reasoning. 
We mean not making rash decisions, not acting just off of emotionalism, not going just off a of whim or whatever society might want to do. We're talking about logical answers leading to a logical conclusion. Let me give you an example. Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. Jesus said these words. When Jesus heard that, He said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Now, what He heard was, He had gone to the very people who needed Him most, the tax collectors, the sinners, and the supposedly the righteous people of that day began to complain. They said, if He's the Master, what in the world is He doing over in the slums with those people in essence? Jesus heard that and He made a very logical response. You don't go to the doctor if you feel well. You go to the doctor if you're sick. I'm the great physician. I came to call those who are needing it to repentance. Now you just stop and think about that. Let me give you this illustration. Let's say you wake up and in the morning you wake up and you feel great. I feel great. The sun's shining. It's a wonderful day. I better call the doctor. Well, is that the way you think? Well, of course not. You don't get up feeling great, sun shining. You're ready to go out and approach the day and say, I better go call the doctor. No, who calls the doctor? Somebody who's sick. Those who are well don't need the physician. These people thought they were well, and Jesus is saying, why do you need me? The people who are sick are the very ones who need me. Friend, as I think about the logical nature of Jesus, as He does this over and over again, many times He will answer questions in such a way the Scripture will record, they didn't even question Jesus anymore. They didn't even know how to ask any questions by the time He was through answering. But as I think about this, the Bible teaches that God has given me and He's given you the ability to reason, to look at the logic, to understand and come to the correct conclusion. Isn't that what God wants us to do? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, the Bible says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. God says, Come, let us reason together. Isaiah 1 verse 18, it, it doesn't anger God if we have questions. Isaiah 41 verse 21, there were questions that were asked, no doubt. And God says, ask those questions in essence. But we've got to look to the right source for the answer. What is that source? Acts 17, 11 says, These were more fair-minded than those who resided in Thessalonica, the Bereans were, because they searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Friend, God wants me to use the intellect, the reasoning power that He gave me to come to the conclusions revealed in Scripture. Now, let me just mention a couple of those. Sometimes I hear people say, and it's not a logical idea, but we hear people say it. We hear people sometimes say, you know, God really doesn't care what church you go to. Just go to the church of your choice and God will be happy. Wait a minute now, is that logically what the Scripture records? Friend, it's just not. Jesus said, I will build my church. Who built it? Jesus did. How many churches? His. I will build my church. The Scripture records in Ephesians 1, that's Matthew 16, 18, and 19. The Scripture records in Ephesians 1, verses 21 through 23, that the church is the body. Church is the body, body is the church. Those are synonyms. Ephesians 4, verse 4 says there's one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20, there is but one body. Colossians 3, 15, you are called into one body. Over and over again in the Scripture, we hear the statement there's one body. If the body's the church and there's only one body, and Jesus only promised to build one church. And logically, there's but one church. What about as it relates to the plan of salvation? Sometimes I'll hear people say things like, just say the sinner's prayer and you'll be saved. Friend, you know what's amazing? You don't find a sinner's prayer in the Bible. Billy Graham went around the country telling people just to pray the sinner's prayer, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and save me now. You can't find that in the Bible anywhere. You can read from Genesis 1-1 to the very last word of Revelation 22. You don't find that. I hear people sometimes say, all you've got to do to be saved is believe. And yet James 2-24 in those exact words says, faith only will not save. What does one have to do to be saved? You've got to believe in Jesus. John 8-24. 
You've got to turn from sin. Acts 3 verse 19. You've got to confess with the mouth Christ as Savior. Romans 10 verse 10. And the Scripture teach, teaches that you must be immersed in water to be saved. Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus who had asked the question, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the answer was, Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so I want to use the reasoning power just as Jesus did to come to the correct conclusion, conclusion as the Lord Himself also did. When I think about the nature of Jesus, let's also realize that Jesus was a man of great power. Uh, listen again to Mark chapter 4, verse number 41. After Jesus has completely calmed the tumultuous sea, which the disciples thought was about to wreck the boat, here's what's recorded. The Bible says, And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey Him? You think about many of the miracles that Jesus did. Uh, taking the few fish and loaves of bread and feeding 5,000. Raising dead Lazarus. Uh, you could think of a host of other miracles. Healing people from a distance as He did with Jairus' daughter. The woman who had the flow of blood in Mark chapter 6. I mean, on and on and on. You think about the, the miracles of Jesus and you can see the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was indeed a powerful person. A friend, I want to ask you to think about this with me. What was the purpose of Jesus' power and His miracles while He was on it. Was it just to show His power? Was it just for people to look? In a sense, it was to show Jesus as the Son of God. But friend, the miracles and the power of them was not just for physical gratification alone. What was the purpose of miracles in the Bible? Mark chapter 16, verse number 20, and Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4, clearly teaches that it was to confirm the Word. Jesus spoke. He claimed that He was the Christ. He claimed His message was from God. He taught people to repent and obey the gospel. And He preached that message. How did people know that was the right message? Let me give you another illustration. Let's say, let's say we're living in the New Testament day and age. And two people rise up and both of them say, I have a message from God. One preaches one message. One preaches a totally different message. How am I going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, who's right? Well, this man over here said he had a message from God and he proved it by raising somebody from the dead. This man over here said he had a message from God and he took a few pieces of bread and a few fish and he fed 5,000 people and they took up 12 baskets of fragments. I don't have to wonder which one was from God. This man over here, no proof. What's the purpose of Christ's miracles? To prove he was the Son of God. That's the purpose of signs and miracles in the New Testament. And the sign in and of itself was never just to be a sign alone. It always taught a lesson. For example, John chapter 11. Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come forth. That man had been dead for many days and by that time was stinking. Came forth from the grave. What lesson did he teach? I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus took those few fish and few loaves of bread and He turned it into enough food to feed 5,000 people. What did He teach? I am the bread of life. You follow me, you'll never hunger or thirst again. The, the withered fig tree, when Jesus saw that fig tree and it was claiming to produce figs and He was hungry and He wanted to eat something from that and, and it claimed to do something that it did it, and Jesus cursed it. What was the point of that? You're going to claim spiritual fruit you've got to produce. You're going to claim you're a child of God. You've got to bear fruit. You can't just claim it. You can't just wear the garments and look the look. You've got to also walk the walk and talk the talk. It's not enough just to say something, claim something. You also have to do that. Then, as we think about the nature of Jesus, I want you to see Jesus as the perfect, ideal person in the New Testament. Listen to the words of Mark 7, 37. Probably could not sum up the life of Christ any better. The Scripture records in Mark 7, verse 37, And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. You know, when I think about Christ, 
that perfect person. What a great statement of Mark 7, 37. He's done all things well. Well, in what way was Jesus that ideal or perfect person? Jesus was perfect in that He never became contaminated with sin. God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, uh, Hebrews 4, 15, He committed no sin. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. He did everything perfectly in accomplishing the will of God. God cried out from heaven in Matthew 17, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He pleased the Father in what He did. And friend, He's the perfect example for us to follow. We can talk about Christ and His perfection and, and we realize our own imperfection. I realize I've sinned. You realize if you're of an accountable age, you've sinned. What does Christ as the perfect person do for me and you? Friend, it raises the bar. It helps me to have a goal to reach. It, it gives me somebody to look up to and it gives me a type, a, an example that I want to follow. I want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Do I do that perfectly? No. We step aside sometimes. We fall from time to time. But I know where those steps are. I know what God wants me to do. I know the kind of life Christ wants me to live and it indeed encourages me in that aspect. Here's a perfect example for us to follow and it teaches us about the nature of Christ and it's that Jesus was a man of proper priorities. I want you to look in the scripture in Mark chapter 8 and I want you to notice the questions asked the rhetorical questions asked by Jesus in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. Scripture records, Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What makes this uh, Jesus being a man of proper priorities? Jesus asked, What's it going to profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will you give in exchange for your soul? Jesus held as the highest priority the soul of man. If you could gain the whole world and you lost your soul, what, what good would that do you? It, what could you give that would be of more value than your soul? Friend, the principle is the importance of the soul. Jesus held first things first. He had proper priorities and throughout His life, he taught us to do the same. For example, as I look at Jesus as a man of proper priorities and as I view my life and strive to live for Him, Jesus taught me and He taught you. He taught us, seek first the kingdom of God. Where's the priority? God's kingdom. Kingdom's the church. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. Therefore, above all else, the church ought to be right at the top of my list. Jesus taught us our priority ought to be looking up. Colossians 3.1 If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Don't, don't look down. Don't get caught up in the here and now. Don't let the world bog you down. Rather, if you've been raised with Christ, keep your gaze pointed up. Look up toward heaven and the goal. Jesus taught us to live as Him, to live as Christ. Philippians 1.21, Paul said, or Paul taught us, for to me, to live as Christ and to die is gain. There's my priority. Seeking first the kingdom, looking up, keeping my gaze focused on heaven, uh, living for Christ every day, and living, truly living, as a sacrifice. Now, we mention this because as you'll see in Scripture, and as you look at the world around us too many times, other things get in the way and become our priority when they shouldn't. Let me give you an example. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. You've got the story of Mary and Martha. And Jesus comes to their home. And Martha there is distracted with much serving. Serving's good, but not according to what Mary was doing. Mary sat at the feet of the Savior and she learned. And Martha became disgruntled and she said to the Savior, uh, Tell my sister in essence to get in here and help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. One thing is needful and Mary's chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. Martha chose to go in the kitchen and work. Both were good, which was better. Studying, sitting at the feet of Jesus was the top priority. Give me another example. And this is such a, a memorable one. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. You've got the story of a man there who had a great crop year. 
You remember this man? He had such a great crop year. In essence, he said to himself, you've got to tear down your barns and build bigger barns so that you can put all your crops in. And so he did that. But you know what that man forgot? God said to that man, you fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you acquired? And here's the point. So is he who is rich but not toward God. That man had a great crop year. Nothing wrong with that. He was a good businessman. Maybe he needed to build down his barns and build bigger ones. He said to his soul, you've got many goods, laid it for many years. Take it easy in essence. But you know what he never did? Thought about his soul. He thought about his ground. He thought about his crop. He thought about working. He probably took care of his family. But he never took care of his soul. What a horrible priority that man had. Everything but his soul he thought about. Friend, let's take just a moment and let's think about our soul for a second. At the gospel of Christ in the Lord's church, we want you to know that more than anything, we're concerned about your soul. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about other things. We're not concerned about money. That's not our emphasis. More than anything in all the world, as we think about the life of Christ, we're concerned about people's souls. We desperately want you to go to heaven. If you've never obeyed the gospel, our priority is to encourage you, to, to motivate, to challenge you. Won't you become a Christian? Friend, we ask you to seriously consider. Maybe you've been caught up in the world in the wrong priorities. What's going to happen when you breathe your last? What's going to happen when Christ comes back and you're not ready? Are you a Christian? If not, here's what you need to do. You desperately need to think about your soul. And as you read the Bible, we encourage you to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Believe with all your heart. Acts chapter 8, verses 31 through 35. Would you be willing to repent and turn from sin? Acts 3, verse 19. Why not make that great confession that Jesus asked? He is the Christ, the Son of God. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And would you do what Jesus said? Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. We hope and encourage you to think about your soul and join us again as we study more about Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is taking the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Forever with His bride, this is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.